I can't believe it's the fifth week already. And we're going to lose an hour of sleep soon in a couple of weeks. I'm so upset. I do not want to lose an hour of sleep, but it's coming. It's like three weeks away. It's a move our clocks forward an hour. Boo. Boo. Yeah, sleeping late, that's that's gonna that's gonna hurt. Um and have I heard about the botnet? Yes, I have. Nobody is immune. It was just a matter of time for the new uh for the new M1s to get hit with a botnet. The weird thing is it doesn't have a payload. So either the writers uh, put it out into the world too early, or they're just bad coders and didn't do a good job in it, and it just went out into the wild. Uh, because I kind of doubt that that was on, done on purpose, that it, they put a botnet out, it has 30,000 max and no payload. It's just a little weird. It could. So Ricotta could block uh, calls home. So I'll have to set up correctly. Same with other IDSs. They could do the trick as well. Ah, it is 11. As usual, this won't be a long lecture. So this won't take too long. Get in the right folder. Awesome. Module five, as we pass the first quarter of the class, moving on to the second. Um, spring break is three weeks away. <laughs> uh, this chapter is a lot about undercover stuff. Uh, for example, uh, working undercover is the process used to acquire information without the individual or the suspect knowing the true identity of the investigator. This can be done with things like background checks, uh, building a profile through reconnaissance methods online, through surveillance, uh, monitoring a suspect's residence, movement, daily routine, chat rooms, user groups, all that kind of stuff to build a behavioral profile, and sting operations. Uh, designed to catch the criminal in the act of committing or planning to commit a crime. It is not difficult for a detective to create what's called a sock puppet or an undercover identity to perform recon on a suspect or use in a sting operation. There are tons of things where you can create your own fake name. You can, you can use the, this person does not exist to create a profile picture. 
and you know you can use email, text. Uh, you could do uh, financial VPNs. You can do all kinds of stuff to mask your identity, to mask uh, who you truly are as a, as an investigator when you are working undercover. Uh, law enforcement also uses uh, what's called LEAP or the Local Number Portability Enhanced Analytical Program to track criminals who try to evade investigation by switching phone carriers. Uh, like they use this tool like uh, reverse lookings. Of course, uh, as long as they have the, the rights, they can also do wiretaps. Uh, the dark web, which is always deemed as something super scary and, and unknown, it's not really, it's just unindexed. Um, the, the World Wide Web, or the clear web in this case, is easy to use with traditional browsers because most things are indexed. You know, you can use any, any search engine to go after and find information. It's, it's easy to access. It's, uh, it's not hiding behind another protocol. It's a piece of cake. The unindexed part of the web is what's called the dark web because it's encrypted while using the public internet. But in and, in and of itself, it's not scary or threatening or, or mysterious, like people like to, to frame. There are tremendous amounts of resources that you can use to find uh, information through open source intelligence. The OSINT framework is a site that gives you a chart like this, where you can really dig down to find what, what tool you can use to find what you're looking for. It is a great resource, OSINT framework, highly recommend. Uh, of course, there is the Onion Router, T-O-R, Tor, the free open source and open network that allows users to surf anonymously and I put that anonymously with a little asterisk. Users can download the Tor browser bundle to connect via proxies to the Tor network. Uh, websites that aren't no normally accessible through the clear web, like dark web sites can be accessed this way. Um, it is somewhat problematic for investigators because identities are somewhat obfuscated and the site's locations are typically unknown. Yes, it is known to conduct criminal activities and breeding ground from malware, uh, but let me just be clear that people use Pastebin, which is a clear net site to put up all kinds of information, malware and so on. So it, it is not just the dark web. That's the only place where people put up malicious stuff or do malicious things. It happens over the clear web all the time. Uh, Tails is um, otherwise known as the Amnesic Incognito Life System. It provides anonymity for the user since it boots from USB and it doesn't leave any records left on things like RAM, in, on the hard drive, doesn't, doesn't leave any footprint of its use. And does connect to Tor uh, right away. Another tool similar to Tor is the Invisible Internet Project. Uses public private key encryption with websites hosted anonymously. Uh, on the suspect's computer, you'll find a router.config, which contains information about the connectivity. And any I2P files are associated with this network. There's also the Secure Drop, an open submission system funded by the Freedom of the Press Foundation for whistleblowers to communicate with journalists. There's dark web marketplaces that have come up and down. Um, for example, one of the more famous is the Silk Road. It was used by criminals to sell drugs, counterfeit documents, other illegal stuff uh, using Bitcoin. Uh, it took a while, but it was taken down by the FBI and Homeland Security. But being it, the internet, 
more just pop up. If you shut one down, more pop up. Operation Bayonet was used to shut down two marketplaces, Alpha Bay and Hansa. Uh, one of them was European. And I believe the other one was in Asia. This is really a show of the world law enforcement can team up together to take down these, these criminal sites. And again, just because they're on the unindexed dark web doesn't mean they're immune to the law. You know, if they're doing criminal activity, they're gonna get caught. It's always just a matter of time. Uh, big uh, virtual currencies. Normally we work with fiat currency, which is legal tender backed by a government or governments like the US dollar or the Euro. Uh, virtual currencies are non-state sponsored currencies that are sent from one device to another. It's only transferred once an algorithm is solved by a middleman or a miner. A public ledger of transactions assures the integrity of the transactions. Not all virtual currencies are cryptocurrencies, like a second life which uses Linden dollars. Virtual currencies carry tax consequences in different jurisdictions, such as the US, where the IRS uh, will consider a Bitcoin miner as a money service business. Bitcoin, is a cryptocurrency, decentralized peer-to-peer -peer virtual currency. It is not illegal in the US and can be used for anything from totally benign to nefarious uses, just like real money. The currency uses Bitcoin wallets to store the currency with uh, many to choose from are encrypted with like SHA-256 or the public private key. Uh, investigators would need to search for anything like a wallet.dat file on a suspect device to find a wallet. A Bitcoin miner will solve a mathematical problem requiring tremendous computing power before forwarding the Bitcoin currency to the recipient. In return, the miner will receive a small percentage of Bitcoin for solving the algorithm. The blockchain is an electronic public ledger that keeps track of all Bitcoin transactions or blocks. Although publicly visible, determining who is responsible for each transaction is problematic without knowing the date and time of a transaction and knowing the identities of the people. Each block can also be a combination of user transactions. Criminals will use services like Bitcoin Tumblr to mix up their transactions with others or convert one cryptocurrency to another. Venmo and Vicemo are also two peer-to-peer -peer services that law enforcement can use to get information. But um, honestly, it just because people use Bitcoin and try to hide themselves doesn't mean they can hide completely. You know, it is always possible to find uh, information. For example, with Bitcoin, you just have to, uh, for example, wiretap and watch the the uh, the blockchain. You start seeing things that are happening in order, then you can start drawing up that profile. You know, it nothing is nothing is 100% secure. Nothing is 100% anonymous. You can't hide from the law. You just simply can't because sooner or later you will get caught. And us as investigators, it's our job to help find those criminals to help uh, sift through the evidence to, to point to what's important and necessary for the prosecution of defense to use. Online reconnaissance can vary greatly depending on the needs of the investigator. Many websites provide basic information and you could use all kinds of sites like the one, like the ones provided by OSINT to get more information like personal information, interesting groups, uh, instant messaging, social media, uh, using protocols, uh, all kinds of information you can grab from the web. Uh, 
Uh, the Wayback Machine can also be a great source for getting information because you can look at historical snapshots of a site. So if a criminal was using a site and it was backed up by the Wayback Machine, you can use that. Online crime, which happens all the time, can happen with things like identity theft, which can happen without the need to know a user's password. With enough open source intelligence knowledge, a password can be reset with the information gathered. That's where MFA comes into place. Credit cards for sale happens all the time. Uh, electronic medical records, they're actually more valuable than social security numbers on the black market. Counterfeit and counter proliferation investigations with things that are being exported or imported, a cyber bullying, and social media. These are all uh, online crimes that as investigators, you may have to investigate uh, depending on what happens on in your organization or you know, if you're working for law enforcement, whatever case comes up, these are things that you will need to be aware of. Any questions? What do people do with medical records? Uh, they can impersonate, they can use the blackmail, they can do all kinds of, of all kinds of things, call it all kinds of extortion to a person with medical records. Could find out what uh, what ailments they have and, and try to uh, fish them by, by saying, hey, uh, we know you use this medicine, but you can use this for cheaper if you give us your, your financial info. You can get really crafty with that information. Any other questions? Okay, I'm gonna stop the recording and make this video and then I will show you the new things that are happening for the next four weeks. I make a new share and I switch to this. Close out of that for now. Eighty percent done. Okay. All right, so things are changing. At this point, you should have already completed the autopsy training. And now you will begin working on cases. So for the next four weeks, starting with this week, I have a case every week for you to do. This will be the first case that you'll do. This is getting you in, getting you on the road to getting ready for the small and large cases that you'll be doing in the second half of the semester. So this case one is a graded quiz. So you don't have to submit anything like a, like a report. You just have to answer questions in the, um, in the quiz. I have already put the questions here. So what you need to do is you'll need to go to the Google Drive where you had the videos for autopsy. And you'll see case one, case two, case three, case four. Ignore these. I'm going to be adding more cases soon. So for now, you're just going to go into case one 
and there's the zip file you need, a small one at that. Feel free to use any of the tools that you have at your disposal. Remember in module one, we set up uh, Scotty and Sans Sift and whatnot, and you also went through autopsy training. So use all those tools and any other online tools to help you answer these questions. This, this is your first run as an investigator. As always, I do not expect anyone to work completely on their own unless you absolutely want to. It is optional for you to work on your own. Uh, you can always work with others. And I, I encourage you to work with others, uh, specifically because as you go through the next couple of cases, things are going to get harder. There's going to be more to search. And honestly, one person by themselves could probably not be able to do all the cases. This first case you could probably do on your own. But as, as we go into cases three and four and then the others, um, I think it, it would be beneficial to everyone to work together, which I know is such a reverse from a normal class where you're supposed to be able to do it on your own and whatnot, but um, investigators work in groups. So I don't see a logical reason to force you to work on your own. So check out the little story. I gave you the, the MD5s in case, uh, in case of any corruption. And I also gave you some questions for you to tackle. So my honest suggestion is have the answers to these before you take the quiz. So go through the evidence, get answer the questions to the best of your ability, provide the answers ready, then go ahead and take the quiz and put your answers in uh, to these questions. You'll have 15 minutes to submit. Questions about the assignment this week or your, your case, your first case. I see no questions. Oh, I do see a question. Let me finish doing this thing so that it uploads, publish. Okay. Will it work to split up the work by making a group and having each person answer three other questions and sharing answers? I don't care how you do that. I'm not gonna micromanage you. You can split it up, you can divide in half, divide however you want. Uh, there are quite the number of people in this course, so you should be able to ping each other on Discord and iron that out. The, uh, the real purpose of these labs isn't to see how, uh, isn't, this isn't necessarily the answer, but more so how you work together, uh, how you solve these challenges. It's really the, the using information more so than getting information. You know, it's not, this isn't a math class where you have to know the formula uh, in your mind before walking in. It's here's, here's the information. Now let's, let's get, let's do something with it. Other questions? Okay, I don't see other questions in the chat. So as always, if you do come up with some, ask away on 